Okay, it's uh, 7 p.m. now in Australia and 9 a.m. Uh, where you are, I suppose. So well, welcome to the second day of I Was and Mom 2022. And I'm very happy to introduce our uh, keynote speaker for today, uh, Professor Robert Rembo. Uh, he's a professor in the Faculty of uh, Computing at Poznan University of Technology in Poland. Uh, he has extensive experience in data technology, both as an academia and also as an industry practitioner. And I'm, I'm sure this is something that he will bring to the keynote today. Uh, he's also chairing database working group at the IFIP. Um, his research ex expertise is in data integration and he has published extensively in the area, as well as given uh, talk and serve as uh, panel members in many conferences. So I'm sure we will learn something from his talk today. And on that note, I welcome Professor Robert Gramble for his keynote. Thank you, Eric, for this uh, very kind introduction. This is uh, the first time I'm meeting you, unfortunately, in, 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 in a virtual environment. Your name is well known to me, but, <laughs> and, and I hope to see you in Rio. So I will start my talk. Uh, greetings from Barcelona, by the way. Uh, do you want to continue? Yes, and I'm sharing my slides. Okay, so I will, I'll be talking about data integration and uh, after a short introduction to data integration architectures, I address three issues pertinent to research and development projects. I present my personal point of view, thus uh, very subjective on these issues or call them challenges. And uh, this point of view is based on my experience gained from realizing projects for three different companies of having totally different business profiles. So the first project, issue number one, is uh, on optimizing performance of data integration processes. And this, is, this project is being done with IBM Software Lab in Kraków, which is in Poland. Project number two, issue number two, is on cleaning and duplicating large row-like data sets, relational data, to put it simply. And this project is being done for the biggest Polish bank. Project number three, Issue three is on integrating medical data. And this project has started like two months ago for the biggest private hospital in Poznan. Poznan is a city where I live. So since my talk is on data integration, uh, let me start with uh, this slide that shows the number of papers published on data integration topic. And uh, if we can say that since 2005 or six, uh, this topic became quite uh, frequently researched. So let's start with basic data integration architectures. This is a general one that shows that at the bottom there are data sources distributed, heterogeneous, and at the top, there are users that want to access these data sources. And in between, between users and data sources, there is an integration layer, software, hardware, storage. So in this in the integration layer, there are some data integration processes, general processes that, that do the integration and provide data to users. And uh, we, we can have... Uh, two types, generally two, two, two basic types of data integration architectures. One is virtual, when data are accessed in data sources and they are transformed, made available on demand for users. And the three, the most well-known architectures, virtual integration architectures include federated, mediated, and virtual data links. And the second type of data integration architecture is where physical integration takes place. That means that already integrated data by these data integration processes are stored physically and then made available to users. And the most well-known and most frequently used physical data integration architectures include data warehouses and data lakes. And 
Merging these two virtual and physical results in polystore and lambda. So let's focus for a while on data warehouse architecture as this is the context of my talk. So in data warehouse architecture, data sources are integrated by the so-called ETL processes, extract transform load processes, and they are made these integrated data are made available, stored physically in a persistent repository that is called a data warehouse. Then data lake, recently very popular architecture. We have, as, as previously, various data sources distrib distributed highly heterogeneous. And then we have an intermediate layer that is uh, called a data lake that stores data source dumps, versions of data stored in, uh, in, in these data sources, uh, data stored in a data lake are in an original or raw data format, and they are highly, highly heterogeneous. At the lower level, there are some storage formats, JSON, DEG, Avro, Parquet, and at the hardware level, this stuff is uh, deployed on a cluster or in the cloud. And then we have uh, users that want to do analysis of these data. And these data, of course, since they are in the raw formats, heterogeneous formats, they must be converted, transformed into a format that would be, a, would, would be suitable for analysis. And of course, we have two layers here. And traditional layer like ETL, that loads to a data warehouse. So this is physical integration architecture. Well, this is a data warehouse architecture, to put it simply. And then we have a virtual layer that integrates data, fresh data on demand. This, this path allow, <laughs> provides fresh data. And then uh, at the analytical level, these two layers are combined to provide data to users. So the third, the mixture of uh, virtual and, and uh, physical integration, another, because the first one was data lake, the second one is uh, Polystore. Polystore, to put it simple, uh, this, these are data sources at the bottom, and then there are some storage, physical storage of data. The blue one, let's call it as data are stored in the model one, then uh, the green one is model two and uh, the red one is model three. So we have three different storage physical integration. And then you can query these data via by various interfaces. So you can integrate a blue model with green, red with green, red with blue, any available combination. So at the top, there is a virtual data integration architecture. So that was that was the context. Then and now let's focus on, on the data integration processes in the data warehouse architecture. And as I said, there are ETL processes, extract, extract tra transfer and load. The, these processes are also known as data integration pipeline, extract transfer, uh, data processing pipeline, and some other names. These data integration processes are composed of sequences of tasks. And uh, these tasks include ingesting data from data sources, transforming these data to a common data model, to a common format, cleaning data. I will return to this issue soon. Homogenizing, available, making them available in a common format data and data model, then applicating, I'll, I'll raise this issue later on, and uploading to a data warehouse. So issue number one that I would like to point to is optimizing performance of data integration processes. In large banks, they integrate from dozens to over 200 different data sources. In, in banks, they say, name a data source and we have it. So that's, that's the story. 
And then the number of deployed processes to integrate over 200 data sources ranges from thousands to hundreds of thousands. Hundreds of thousands is, I know it, they, they have uh, this number of processes, they have it in pharma. And then if we consider traditional magnetic disks with throughput of 200 mega, megabytes uh, per second to just read, copy paste one terabyte from a data source to a data warehouse would take 160 minutes. And then add on top of this, just copy pasting, add to this processing of data, this, okay, uh, transformation, cleaning, the duplication, you can multiply this time n times. So a conclu the conclusion is that optimizing performance of data integration processes is vital to the whole data integration architecture. And uh, there are some problems, or call them, let's call them issues. We would like to have, this is my, my, my point of view, we would like to have uh, a tool, a means for optimizing ETL processes, but based on cost-based optimization, like in SQL. So you would give a, to the system a process and say, okay, run it as fast as possible, as efficiently as possible. And the system would do some stuff behind and run these processes efficiently. So for this, we would need a data, integr the data integration process execution plan and its optimization methods, like an SQ1. But the first problem is computing statistics on data sets to be processed. You should have these statistics and uh, processed data sets are not available in advance, like in databases. You just ingest them, then you have them. And now you would be able to compute these statistics. Of course, that would increase the, the, the process execution time. So it's, it's a problem to be solved. Then problem number two is we would need to have a cost model. But this cost model is much more complex than for SQL select. Why? Because data integration tasks are much more complex. They may be and frequently are user-defined functions. And frequently these UDFs are black boxes. So as a consequence, their cost model is unknown. Their semantics is unknown or it's partially known. And uh, typically UDFs are executed as programs external to an ETL engine. So what uh, industry does to optimize ETL processes or data integration processes, the first, uh, the first approach is, the first solution technique is to increase resources, CPU, memory, the number of nodes. That is called vertical and horizontal scaling. The second approach is to parallelize data integration tasks if an ETL engine or data integration engine is run in a cluster, you can do it. And all commercial ETL or data integration engines provide this kind of parallelization. Then the third approach in industry is to apply task reordering. Very simple technique, changing the order of some tasks to build a more efficient data integration workflow. And uh, they apply this technique that filtering should be put at the very beginning of a data integration process to minimize as soon as possible the amount of, the amount of data ingested to the uh, data integration workflow. And uh, there are two well-known techniques the first one is push down, and the second one is balanced. Push down means moving some tasks, the execution of executing some tasks in a data source rather than an, in an ETL engine. Like here, for example, in this example, an original workflow extraction, filtering, and some tasks, and then aggregating and loading into a data warehouse. Push down would mean 
move filtering into a data source, execute it there, and then balanced would mean move some tasks to a destination, like move aggregate, in our example, to a data warehouse, execute aggregation there in, in the destination system. So push down is uh, is available in Informatica, where whereas balanced is available in IBM information, uh, IBM Infosphere data stage. Okay, but they support task reordering that are expressed by SQL, SQL only. So, but uh, <clears throat> there is uh, still an open issue in push down or balanced optimization. How to efficiently implement a given code snippet, a given task in a source system after pushing it down there? Well, you can use in the, in the data source, probably you can use, you can create dedicated indexes for that task. You can use partitioning, parallel processing, and uh, some other techniques available in a given data source. But there is no um, an automatic method to, to figure out, to design, to implement a task pushed down in a, into a data source. And another issue is pushed down for no SQL data sources. We have we don't know exactly how to implement these uh, push downs in relational systems, and then on top come for uh, no SQL data sources, and uh, it's even more difficult. Uh, this this uh, challenge is uh, really not yet well researched, and uh, some preliminary work. We've done some preliminary work. You can uh, see the refer reference on and, or to this paper, but this is really preliminary. And then the approaches in research to data integration processes in optimization, partitioning and parallelization. Parallelization as well in research. The idea of, of uh, this approach is to split a process, a complex process into smaller parts, simpler parts. They, they split it vertically and then horizontally. And then, uh, for example, this is the whole process and you split it vertically. You have uh, then uh, after splitting it vertically, you have one, two, three, four par uh, uh, horizontal partitions. And then you apply parallelization to these parts and multi threading of uh, tasks uh, to tasks with heavy load. So, parallelization this, this uh, sub workflow was paralyzed by n processes that do in parallel the same extract, transform, and something. And then uh, tasks with heavy load are multi-threaded. In the research, they proposed also task reordering the, with the goal to find the cheapest order of tasks and uh, having some developing some costs, including time and the process data volume. So each task gets get assigned this cost. Then then uh, the reordering takes place. But the space of all possible reordings, uh, valid reordings, let's say, is huge. So it's impossible to, to, to check every possible valid reordering. So some they propose, the authors propose some heuristics like filter data as soon as possible to prune the research space. Uh, then uh, they propose some a reordering criteria. Of course, some reorderings are compatible, some are not. So you cannot reorder incompatible tasks. If task two outputs three variables and task three expects three variables and outputs two, then you have some constraints on input and output. So this, is the, this was taken into account in, in these uh, approaches. But again, not fully solved. Of course, uh, <laughs> this is a problem that is difficult to solve. And then on top of this, we have user-defined functions. Again, in a, in a data integration workflow, we can have UDFs that are either black boxes. You just have its input interface, 
and you have its output interface, nothing more. And some of them, of course, are white boxes. You, you know everything about a, a task, but uh, these tasks may be called outside of an ETL engine. As a consequence, ETL optimization is still challenging. And uh, in my bank project, we are using this kind of white boxes that are called from outside of, of an ETL engine. An ETL engine is uh, based on Informatica, whereas our part of our data, the application pipeline is implemented in Python. So it's called, it's an external module to an ETL engine. Okay, black box opening. There are some approaches to black box opening. Some authors propose to annotate codes of black boxes, but then if it's annotated, it's probably not a full black box. So, and you, you have to annotate every every task when whereas the, if there are thousands of thousands of tasks, you would need to annotate the annotation work would be quite substantial. So um, an idea that we are right now investigating is to use a uh, machine learning to learn to open a black box of course everybody is using machine learning why not we <laughs> so the our idea is to train a, a classification model for time series on known cpu and memory usage characteristics of a given udf we know a udf we run some experiments on this UDF performance experiment, collect CPU and uh, memory are user characteristics. We have our database, then we train model. And then when the new UDF arrives or is uh, to be open, we use this, we, we use a classificator to, to find to which class of UDFs it belongs. So, uh, the disadvantage of this approach is that huge, a huge database of performance character characteristics is needed. But uh, an interesting observation is that that um, some operations have similar, I mean, the same operation have similar has similar uh, characteristics performance characteristic like this, for example. This is a CPU usage for filtering. Okay, we can see some a pattern. Let's say this is uh, the yellowish one is for a bigger data set. The black one is for smaller data set. And then filtering with, this is, this, this is a characteristic for filtering using one condition, whereas the right hand side one is filtering with two conditions, but one is in common between this and this. So as we look at the, look at these uh, two charts, we could see that there is there are some similarities. So this is this is our our hope. So we right now we are investigating this this approach with built an environment, a micro cluster with real nine real machines using uh, on top of this, there, there was Spark. And we implemented five UDFs with one is uh, that implements filtering, then aggregation, filtering plus aggregation, filtering plus join and filtering join aggregation. We collected over three, 33,000 of characteristics of RAM and CPU usage. And we started working on this. Of course, uh, we, we can argue these are very simple functions, but we have to start with something, with something that is simple and we understand. And uh, there are some specialized, specialized algorithms for time series classification, because this is this chart present, in fact, time series. So there are some ready to use algorithms for time series classification. And to, we applied them and we got we applied them to these five functions, five UDFs on two different data sets. And this, this chart shows the average accuracy 
for detecting uh, the aforementioned UDFs on two different data sets with different day, two different data sizes. Okay, we can again argue if accuracy is the right measure, but this, these are pre preliminary results. I think that they are promising. So there is a ref reference to our publication on this. Then uh, there are a lot of other challenges on uh, data in within a data integration architecture. The first was is data source evolution and its impact on ETL. Data sources evolve, they change their schemas. And then the, a schema change has an impact on data integration processes, has impact on a data warehouse schema and on uh, analytical applications. And ideally it would be if, if a data source schema changes, an ETL process repairs itself automatically, but this is uh, possible only for very simple ETL processes, uh, and this is a uh, very, very difficult task to solve. I call it the millennial problem in ETL. <laughs> so there are some approaches that try to address this problem, but they are difficult to apply to real size ETL processes. Then another issue is data lineage. Data lineage with UDFs that are black boxes is already challenging. Then temporal objects used in, for example, procedures, functions that transform data break lineage. You construct lineage, okay, based on views, materialized views, and then you, you, you have a stored procedure and it uses temporal objects and your lineage is, break, is broken. Uh, recently, like two, two weeks ago, well, it's a, some people from a bank in Poland uh, contacted me with this problem. The real case is they have over 11,000 procedures and functions that include uh, approximately 2 millions of lines of codes, and they ha have over 2,000 views and materialized views. And they would like to construct lineage for their five data sources. It's a small bank. They have only five data sources for which they, they need lineage. And uh, you can see a portion of these are these five data sources. And I this is a portion of this lineage visualization. It it goes to the to my right hand side quite far further far. So the first problem is. I mean, the first is that temporal objects and black boxes make this make lineage difficult. And the second problem is how to efficiently or nicely visualize lineage for large systems. And then there is, of course, I'm returning to this slide, data evolution and its impact on lineage. You constructed your lineage. It took like a couple of hours to to construct this image and then a data source evolves and then you have to reconstruct it probably incrementally, but this is an open issue. Then uh, conclusions on, on this part of my talk. talk. Optimization techniques used uh, in uh, data integration, parallelization used by commercial in, 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 in commercial systems and research, task reordering in research, Balanced push down. This is commercial and research approach. Task reordering, it's computationally complex and it's difficult to find uh, better reorderings, for efficient reorderings for large data integration processes. UDFs increase the problem. How to discover semantics of a UDF, how to learn its performance characteristics, and how to parallelize a UDF. Once you know what is inside, you can paralyze it probably. 
And uh, we would like to have cost-based optimization of, e of data integration processes, but this is totally open issue. And then uh, lineage and visualization, another issue, push down and balanced optimization, although it's available, but there are some still open issues, whether the optimization may increase the performance of an ETL process, which parameter parameters of uh, of uh, data source may affect performance, which ETL tasks may benefit from this optimization, and how to efficiently implement a task after pushing it down into a data source. And of course, data source and, and its impact of ETL on ETL. Issue number two that I'm going to address is cleaning and deduplicating large row-like data sets. Okay, uh, I'm talking about mainly banking, since my project is for a bank in Poland. But banking, healthcare, commerce, they have all the same problems. All produce faulty, faulty customers' data. I'm focusing on, on customers' data because they are very important for those kind of uh, institutions. There are missing values, erroneous, outdated, and duplicates. In uh, finance, three the most uh, frequent data, the, 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 mo the most uh, frequent sources of duplicate data include. Uh, Financial institution acquisition. One, one institution buys another one with its own internal information system, with their own data, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a great source of duplicates. And then different bank products require separate customer re records. For example, a credit card for to, to, to have a credit, to get a credit card, you need uh, to, to have a to be a customer of a bank. But that to, to, to have a, an account in euros, you have to be another customer of the same bank. So this is, this is these are peculiarities of, of some banks. And of course, imperfection of software used in banks and that allows to enter duplicate data. Okay, the, the duplication, if I have a data set of names, for example, here, several names, and I would like to see which which of of these names are duplicates. I in a, in a naive case, in a, in a naive scenario, I would need to compare every record, every person with every person. So this is quadratic complexity, and uh, my bank example, there are they have approximately twenty millions of customers customer records records and uh, if we wanted to compare every every customer with every customer that would be four multiplied to, to by 10 to the power of 14 and in our case one comparison we compare records okay one record the, the blue one with the green one and one such a comparison takes approximately two microseconds to compare the whole set that would take 24 years. So it's it's unrealistic and some optimization is needed. Fortunately, fortunately, uh, well-known top researchers in the world proposed, a, I call it the state-of-the-art data data application pipeline that is shown on this slide. That is four main steps, block building, that means dividing record into smaller groups, then, uh, block processing, optimizing the number of blocks. You compare records in these blocks and then further you can optimize the, the comparison to, to minimize the number of comparisons. Then you have to match entities, compare these records physically, and then you cluster them into groups of similar records. And in each of these steps, those very famous Top researchers proposed some algorithms, and you can see 14 plus model 14 algorithms for block building, et cetera, et cetera. So, but the problem is, I have a great selection of algorithms, but uh, which algorithm to apply to a given data set, to my data set, to my customers, for example? I should take into account the duplication quality, precision recall, probably, and execution costs of these algorithms. So, 
challenge number one in this context, selecting the best combination of these algorithms. Of course, uh, you would uh, ideally you would search the full space of algorithm combinations, but this is unrealistic. So you would need some kind of knowledge or secret knowledge or domain knowledge to select the best algorithms for a given data that application task at hand. And my conclusion is that an automatic approach that would help in selecting right algorithms, suitable algorithms, does not exist. Okay, challenge number two. You have you compare records, and then you compare you 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 compute similarity measures between records. But there are over forty different similarity measures for text data, and uh, these measures were implemented in I don't know over um, almost one hundred packages, different procedures, and which to use. Which, which similarity measure is the best for given the duplication problem? So to, to give you just an idea, this is these are similarity measures for text data. And I ran an experiment on real data, real customers' data from that from in, in my bank project to find out how these similarity measures behave. All of them were run on the same data set. And you, you, as you can see, the values returned various depending on the measure used. And even the same measure implemented in a, in a different library of Python package provides returns slightly different values. Challenge number three, how to figure out adequate weights for attributes being compared. For example, I'm comparing this blue record, Robert Vrembel, Poland, Professor Data Warehouses. With the, the, the green one, there are some, as you can see, there are some typos, some different, uh, uh, different names used for country, uh, different abbreviations, yeah, different domains. And then I compare if this is exact, this value is exactly the same as this, it is exactly the same as this, etc. So I compare attribute by attribute, but some attributes are more important than others. They we have to weight these attributes to compute the final similarity measures. Okay, some attributes typically have less errors, less nulls than others, some attribute, some attributes less frequently change their values in time. So these are these attributes are better, they should be weighted higher. But what is the, the right weight? We need expert knowledge and learning methods to define right weights or suitable weights. And the same is how to figure out adequate similarity thresholds. Okay, we computed similarity between these two records. It's zero, zero, 007. Does it mean that they are duplicates? I don't know. So we need. A, it's not. It's not a trivial to to define the similarity measure when we treat two records as the same. So again, we need expert knowledge and learning methods for this. Then, uh, of course, machine learning for data that application. Again, we are using it, or we are trying to use it in, in this bank project. But for machine learning, a learning data set is needed. We are applying classification. So our problem is how to construct a learning data set of a reasonable size for 20 millions of customers' database. 10% of this would be Two millions is unrealistic. Uh, just an example. We we've done a manual labeling of one thousand pairs of rows. This 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 labeling was done by three persons, including a bank expert. Labeling throughput was one point three records per minute. So to, to label this 
1,000 of rows took us 22 hours. Okay, so the conclusion is it's impossible to construct a learning data set manually for such a large data set. Okay, po a possible solution is automatic labeling, for example, snorkel, but it needs rules. Okay, we constructed this 1,000 rules. Then based on these rules, records are labeled by this. Well, it is a magic black box. It labels records, but rules don't cover every record. And then this, this software labels somehow, somehow, uh, figures out how to label records not covered by rules. But then the problem is how to verify whether these records were labeled correctly. We are talking about 20 millions of rows. Oh, let's take a 10% sample, 2 millions of rows. You are unable to verify such a number of rows manually within a limited time or finite time. So another possible solution for uh, machine learning for data that application is active learning, but then uh, we have the same problem. You are not able to verify the, the results on such a huge data. Challenge number seven already in data that application, large data sets may need hundreds of rules. In this labeling example, Based on this labeling example of 1,000 pairs, we constructed 89 rules, 89 rules. Already, it was a nightmare to manage these rules without the software. Rule subsumption detection is needed, and rule firing optimization is needed. For example, if, if one rule says this, this pair of records is not, they are not duplicates, and another rule says, oh, they are probably duplicates. In our approach, we say they are not duplicates. We apply the most restrictive rules always because that is the requirement from the bank. So if we had 100 rules that would be applicable, that would need to be fired for a given pair of, pairs of records, if the rule saying no would be the last one, you would fire 99 rules uselessly. So opt rules optimization, uh, I mean, uh, the order of uh, rules firing is needed. Is We have to figure out the right order, the efficient order. So, but no support from, from uh, software so far. Then the rules visualization, we, we, had, uh, we have 80, 89 rules and already have problem in managing them manually. How to visualize these rules? That for, for us, this is a challenge. And uh, yes, challenge, the last one is uh, how to efficiently verify a model on dozens of thousands of records. You, should, you, you would need to, to do it manually, of course. And there are some attempts to, okay, some, uh, Lessons learned from our project that that uh, was were published in this in these papers. Okay, business reality is to sum up this this short, this story about data the, the application. Business reality that we encountered: data the application pipeline has to accept partially dirty data. Research approaches assume that okay, the input to data into the to a DDP has to be cleaned. But no, it's impossible to clean all data in real, in reality. 20 millions of rows, you can do some basic cleaning only within a limited time. So in reality, you run data the application on partially dirty data. Then the developed algorithms and models must be first intuitive, second understandable, third easy to implement by the IT staff in a bank, in our bank. Ideally, these algorithms and models should be based on an out of the box software component. This is ideal case. 
impossible to, 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 to fulfill this. Efficiency of a data data application pipeline. Yes, we are going to duplicate dozens of millions of records. Next, the, the, the produced software has to be deployable in a specific architecture of a company, specific software and specific hardware because they are using only licensed and, and certified software. So you cannot use anything. You just, you have a set of Python libraries, like in our case, that are certified by the bank and nothing else is available. And I'm uh, approaching the last issue that is uh, integrating medical data. Okay, we are talking about health information systems, and we know that they store highly heterogeneous data. Electrocardiogram time series and other waveform data from bedside devices. Then diff different types of medical images, ultrasound, magnetic resonance, Positron emission tomography, computed computed tomography, endoscope, etc., 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 and all these all these uh, images have to be stored, queried. Then on the other side we have traditional data, texts, longer texts. I would say physicians' notes in different formats text, word, format, uh, sometimes spreadsheets, prescriptions, diagnosis, and treatments, sometimes in XML. Uh, there are patient metadata, of course, that glue all of these types of data, patient name, um, national ID, age, address, contact numbers, and uh, of course, lab results always in PDF. And now the question is how to efficiently integrate these data, data sources, because banks, they want to, to build right now, uh, at least the one that, that and, and a few others that I know, they are, willing to build a system, let's call it data lake, that will provide a customer 360 degree patient view, not customer view, patient view, but you need to integrate all, all types of data. On top of this, you have genomic data. In, in this hospital that I'm doing the project, they are also willing to integrate genomic data. To, to, to build models for predicting uh, if a given patient is prone to get a disease, a certain disease in uh, the future. Okay, medical data suffer from poor quality. It's even worse than in uh, financial institutions, of course we see duplicate patient data, no doubt, a lot of duplicates. There are faulty data as always, wrong, typos, missing. In different formats, like for example, uh, this in one system, uh, storing images, you retrieve images querying Robert Vrembel. You go to the other one, and you query the same patient this way, capital letters only, and ma there must be a comma. Otherwise, this person would not be found. In another system with uh, medical images, you query this like capital, last name in capital, the rest may be not so important. So this is, well, this is rather a technical problem, but it's real, it exists. And then wrongly annotated images. Images are processed by at least 
two persons in in a, in a hospital. One, is, the first one is physician that makes a, an image, runs uh, this machine to to take an image, and then annotates it, typing from keyboard. So the images are described in in a special format that is called DICOM. DICOM has it's a it has tags and values like XML or JSON. And then uh, there is let's call that let's assume that there is a tag body part and a physician a, a, a technician annotated it chest. As you can see, it's not definitely it's not chest, it's neck. But this is a typical error that we encounter. And now the problem is how to clean, correct these wrong annotations. Our idea is to try machine learning image discovery to see what part of image is that and whether this, this is um, uh, consistent with, with this text annotation. But this project has just started, as I as I told you, two months ago. So I cannot say anything on on this type of cleaning, not yet. Okay, so we would like to integrate different types of medical data. They are highly heterogeneous, and data of a patient or of a patient are distributed in multiple storage systems. Health information systems that store textual data, radiological information systems store text data, and um, uh, these um, screening procedures, whereas PAX stores images. And to get the full image of a body checking, I mean, um, to get the full description all images of a given person you have to query these three systems types of systems but these systems are come from typically typically they come from multiple vendors even okay typically in 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 the in the hospital that i i'm doing project they have uh, at least two different pieces each of it, of it, which come from a different vendor. And uh, they've done, some time ago, they've done a data migration from one image storage system to another. They migrated about 30 terabyte of Im terabytes of images, and it took approximately 30 days. So moving this these data is very time consuming. And the problem, the biggest problem is that these systems, as I said, they come from multiple vendors, but they are totally closed. You cannot export data out of them. So you cannot migrate your data from one system to another, from one producer to your own in-house developed system. Impossible, impossible. Okay, to, to conclude, uh, and well, this is the biggest challenge so far we are facing. Totally closed system, you cannot export, you cannot get in to, the, to, to a system, you cannot ingest all data from such a system. To sum up, I started my talk with uh, a chart and I'm finishing my talk with another chart. <laughs> this is on... on a topic health informatics, the number of papers on health informatics. And as, as we can see, it no doubt it's becoming uh, another hot topic. So that I, I think that um, okay, there are in my talk there were there were a lot of challenges, open issues, I call them problems, but these come these problems come from my experience. They are unsolved or partially solved. And my takeaway message is, well, I, I'm promoting these problems <laughs> because it's, you know, they are, I would say, essential why, why doing uh, research and development projects for companies. Thank you very much for listening to my talk. Thanks, Robert. 
So uh, I open the, the forum. Any questions? Uh, you can uh, turn on your camera and then ask questions. Or if you prefer, you can actually write questions on the chat. Maybe while everyone's waiting, I'm, I just, I have a question, uh, Robert. Uh, I, I, I remember, I know that you, you have these uh, insights from your experience uh, working in industry as well. But uh, during the presentation, it seems to me like only a very small subset of problems that you mentioned are addressed by commercial systems. And most of, I think it's only about the optimizations of data integrations when you talk about some commercial systems address them. But all the others seems are quite, black box we call it there's no there is no uh, uh systems that 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 uh can address it so i suppose if a bank or a hospital wants to solve it they have to have a in-house uh systems to, to do it which is probably not scalable and not efficient if everyone's doing it themselves so i'm not sure uh whether you have any any insight on how to bring about this to commercials uh database commercial mm -hmm. systems uh, okay, I can. Well, I I haven't mentioned this, but uh, in the evolution on data source of data sources and their impact on ETL, uh, some banks apply. They call it okay. They are they are using ab initio, where you can define the so-called generic ETL processes, and gener generic means uh, that they expect uh, as input they expect parameters like data source table for example its attributes etc and then okay you provide it to this etl and it runs in just in data ingestion etc etc but uh, it does not solve uh, fully the problem of etl of, of etl evolution because it's again a human that has to when a data source changed you have to provide a new input um, modified input to these generic ETL processes. So a manual effort is needed again. So this is uh, commercial systems. They, of course, they support um, um, this kind of de dependency analysis. When I change this table, okay, these procedures are affected, these views, et cetera, et cetera. It helps in lineage as well, of course, of course. Uh, SQL Server has some, uh, uh, some tools that allow you to track dependencies within, within the procedures and uh, but as i said this okay there exist tools but they don't solve all problems like black box well you cannot do about much about this in neither in lineage or no in etl and then uh, in, when you have um, a, what i wanted to say Mm, oh, I forgot I had I wanted to say something important but uh, okay 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 uh, so they 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 don't provide this these uh, tools for full lineage ah temporal objects yes they don't hand, they are not able to handle temporal objects in lineage that that's why that what I showed you here in uh, this uh, slide with lineage oh this one this is in-house developed tools in the bank because there was nothing available nothing reasonable available so that that's true that yeah the, something is missing but i think why commercial software does not fully support or fully support uh, uh, solutions to these problems because they are extremely difficult Generic. extremely and this is for me this is the only explanation all the <laughs> what i'm saying always what i'm always saying is all the easy problems have been already implemented in commercial software the most difficult ones are available for us <laughs> to research. 
Thanks, Robert. Uh, is there any uh, other questions or comments? So I will. I don't see anything in neither. No, I don't see anything in chat. No questions. But I would like to yeah. to comment. One say one one more thing about uh, these uh, health informatics. From my experience, well, from this hospital, uh, doing or building systems for healthcare, it's an extremely good business. It, there is a huge potential. Okay, I'm doing this project for for this for that hospital for free. Okay, as a, you know, kind of let's treat it as a hobby because the problem is fascinating. But when we discuss with with uh, those guys at the hospital, there is so much need for IT technologies in hospitals that it's you know it's it's. I just I don't know. It's like El Dorado, probably. <laughs> yes. So this so is, I think I think yeah. Yeah, we, we all can do health informatics research from now on, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my last takeaway message. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Robert, uh, for the very interesting talk. And then, yeah, thanks everyone for attending. So I think now we are having the 30 minutes break. And after that, uh, you can come again. And then we have two parallel sessions of I, I was and one parallel, uh, one sessions for, for mom. Uh, thanks everyone. And then hopefully see you again in the next sessions. Thank you. Bye.